Hello and welcome to Office Hours. As always, this is where we gather every single day and have for 1,600 plus days to discuss modern web-based production. It's where you can submit questions about media creation, distribution, anything having to do with getting video or audio or anything else across the web to people in a mass broadcast like this. Remember, somebody's going to read your question aloud, so try to construct something that's simple and clear. If you want to, you can use our Mukana system, which is where you can not only put the questions into the show, but vote on those questions. And that becomes important because the questions with the most votes get prioritized. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can use uh, that system or you can use this, which is our QR code that's popping up in the corner. Uh, that QR code will allow you to shoot it with any device that reads them and it'll get you directly into the queue, although someone will read it and make sure that it's suitable and that it's pushed off into the show and you'll see the questions go by as the show happens. That's what we do every single day. So it's time to dive in today. Jason, what do our viewers and listeners have on their minds today? Well, this morning, John Snyder in Reno, Nevada wants to know, um, let's see, my ATEM Mini Extreme ISO started having intermittent issues where one HDMI sends no out signal intermittently, a few seconds to a minute at a time. It's not the cable or the source signal. Thoughts? And Courtney Gooden is going to start us off this morning. Courtney? Well, intermittent uh, issues with a cable, especially HDMI, where you can't just, you know, test the signal easily with a meter. Uh, one thing you are, are really difficult to diagnose, uh, how do you know it's not the cable? Usually it is the cable, uh, or it could be a heat issue. Make sure your uh, uh, the LED brightness level on your ATEM Mini is turned down to about 10% to 20%, because that generates a good deal of heat inside the unit, and the fan will come on. Maybe the fan's dirty if it's an older ATEM Mini, and maybe it's a heat issue. The other thing you can do is run it into uh, M, uh, the decimator MDHX because they uh, – and just run it through that. You can change the frame rate on it. That might uh, help it out. depends on what you're running it into. Are you running it into a monitor? Are you running it into a recorder? What are you running it into? If what you're running it into is a little picky about the signal, it could be the sync signal is not one that it really agrees with. And so it uh, it switches out after a second and switches back because the sync signal is a little bit off. Uh, but if you run it into an MDHX, that will tell you uh, because it has a little LCD display on it and it reads out what the incoming signal is, uh, even if uh, you don't have an outgoing signal. And that will tell you if that signal is coming and going. If it sees that signal coming and going, then you've got a problem with the ATEM. If not, then the signal and the cable are probably good, and it may be a problem with your monitor, whatever you're plugging it into. Uh, so those are a couple of things to try. Um, I would change the cable to a shorter cable, but apparently you must have. That's why you assume that the cable is not the problem. Alex, you want to add? Yeah, I think it's a bad port. <laughs> so, so I think it's either heat damage or, or some kind of uh, access damage, uh, and you probably have to do an RMA on it. I think that, I think that there's a bad port there. Hmm. Okay. Hopefully, John, that'll get you the right path to start down to get this fixed. Let's go to our next question. Douglas Carmichael uh, uh, writes in, I just ordered a Ubiquiti Cloud Gateway Max for my forthcoming fiber connection. How about I transfer the connection from my Unify Express to it and adopt my Express as an access point? Alex, can you help him out? Uh, Mickey McIntyre said, you can save the configuration file on an existing controller and restore it to a new controller. So that um, working with the Ubiquiti products where he's been working them for 15 years and he says he's mostly had bad experiences doing this across different hardware models. Just reconfigure the new controller. Okay. Hopefully that'll take care of you, Douglas. Next question. Gene J. Anthony in Skokie, Illinois writes in, we were told by an expert that we need to go to RAID 10 plus 5 in order to protect us and our friends better. But I don't know what that means. I thought RAID only went to 6. How do you make that work? Does it go to 11? <laughs> Two points for the Spinal Tap reference, Gene. Uh, Jason, help him out. Um, a RAID 10 plus 5 is a combination of a RAID 10 and a RAID 5. I cannot imagine that this is the necessary way for you to be doing this. Um, that is a minimum, I believe, of depending upon how it's configured between 15 and 18 disks. And that is the bare minimum to, to do that correctly. Uh, don't, don't listen to that expert. I'm sorry. It, it, I can't imagine the scenario where that would be your best bet. Hmm, that seems like a lot of hardware to throw at the problem. Uh, hopefully that helps you, Gene. Next question. 
Uh, Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida writes in, Insta360 released the link to webcams. Thoughts? And he includes a news shooter link. Ooh, it'd be interesting to see what news shooter said about this. Courtney Gooden, start us off here. Uh, looks like they've come out with a bigger sensor. And you know, let's take a look at these two things. Uh, the 2 and the 2C. Two, 2 has the gimbal and the 2C doesn't have the gimbal. But it ha- they both have this the AI sound and the AI... Uh, you know, looking around uh, within the 4K uh, uh, area. Um, it looks like it has a clearer sensor. It has AI bokeh that will apply. It'll track the people that are moving in the frame and uh, even uh, put the outside, uh, I mean, put the background in a slightly uh, defocused state. Uh, let's hope it does a very good job. It, it apparently depth senses. I don't know if that's what that little circle is on the top of the uh, camera there. Uh, I do, uh, I do not like the uh, the little ring lo- ring of green that it puts on the camera. Maybe maybe they turn that off. Uh, it only comes on uh, when it's detecting something. It also has uh, steerable audio and noise reduction uh, with AI, so uh, that looks interesting as well. And all the same uh, gesture operated. Uh, uh, effects. It now has a group framing. Yeah, this is an interesting where it can keep multiple people in the group in frame if you tell it to group frame. Uh, and it does all the old things of looking down and flipping the image uh, up right side up for things on your desktop. Uh, and the pricing is uh, similar to how it was before. Actually, it may be a little bit cheaper. It's one uh, one ninety nine for the one with the gimbal, the uh, 360, and uh, the C is uh, 149 So uh, a couple of good prices. Uh, we'll have to wait when they come out. It also does uh, vertical framing for those of you that are involved with social media. Alex, what's your thoughts? Uh, the biggest feature is the price went down. The uh, sensor size is the same. It was a half inch before. It's still a half inch. Um, that's probably the most important feature to me. I would have loved to see a full inch. Um, uh, yeah, the, the Insta360 original was half inch as well. Um, so there's no improvement there. Um, everything else seems mostly software. They made the mic better, which, you know, I don't really consider a webcam a proper usage of a mic. <laughs> so so, um, so it doesn't really move the needle for me. Uh, but the prices are going down. Uh, it's significantly less. The link, it's actually now, I think the link, the second link is less expensive than the first link, uh, which probably meant that they saved money somewhere in manufacturing. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I think that, uh, but I think that it's, at 199 if that's is that the price courtney i didn't see the price at 199 this is the camera like you know for the it's the best yeah. bang for your buck at 199 dollars um you know i don't think that there's anything competitive at that price um, i think that you know the other one that you would look at is obsbot um you know but that's significantly more money so um so i think it's a great camera and it's a great price um i don't think it's significantly better as a link owner i own, own four of these I didn't, I didn't look at it and go, oh, I need to get that. <laughs> like it, but if you haven't gotten one yet, it's a great webcam for $199. Let's go to the next question. Paul Wall, who's in Austin, Texas, writes in, I've got two Ubiquiti slash Synology NAS setups in two locations that are synced. What cloud services can I sync to for a third destination? And he wonders about Google Drive, I see. Alex, what do you think? Backblaze. Now, look at Backblaze. I mean, you know, this is going to be something that you're, these are the kind of things that I don't think Google Drive is really what you want. You want something that anything that's connected to, um, uh, anything that's connected with Backblaze, you know, it'll back up and connected to a computer. So, um, but I would, I would back it to Backblaze. Um, I think Mickey said back up to S3 or Backblaze. I think Backblaze is probably a, 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 um, a more usable thing. I mean, I think S3 is more geeky <laughs> to do that. I mean, it might be less expensive and maybe even more scalable, but if you just want a kind of a turnkey solution to back it up, Backblaze is what you're looking for. Let's go to our next question. Jimmy Gilliberti in North Salem, New York writes in, I have an LTO 8 drive. How would you work this into an archive workflow, mainly for photo, video, media, company versus enterprise? Alex. Personally, I would uh, back that all up to hard drives, and then I would put it in a desk somewhere. Let it let it keep my door open. I mean, I, I just don't. I hate LTOs, and I have for thirty years. <laughs> so, so, I, so I know some people who love these uh, uh, these LTOs, but uh, um, I just 
so many things I don't like about them. I mean, I, and I have lost data on LTOs. I've had people who that's their job is to maintain the data on the LTOs and we lost data. Um, so, uh, so I don't find them as stable as other people think that they are. Um, I think that the cost of storage has gone down enough that I don't think it's worth the trouble. If I'm twitching a little, it's because of my years with a DC 2000 mm. tape drive. That sound mm. <laughs> just is not, stuck in my head and will it. never go away. So I'm a little leery of them too. That was not a good era for me. Uh, next question. Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand writes in from the QR code, is there a way to automatically cycle through each of the four A10 mini inputs with a defined interval in between, perhaps a macro? Jesse Kester, what do you think? Uh, the last time we tried to do this, we weren't able to get across the finish line in the ATEM software, but we were able to do it in BitFocus Companion. The big difference there is that ATEM software doesn't allow you to set um, timer functions on your macros, and BitFocus does, and you don't need an Elgato Stream Deck or anything like that to do this. You can do it all in browser. You set up your macros, uh, program how long you want between each uh, each item in the sequence to take, and then you're you're off to the races. Alex, um, the uh, you, you could use shortcuts in Mix Effect Pro. So Mix Effect Pro will see uh, you know it it, it is shortcut. Um, uh, uh, happy. <laughs> so it can handle shortcuts there. So you could have a shortcut on your Mac and the, and it would simply have a timer there um, and then tell Mix Effect Pro to, to make the change. That's how I would approach it. Uh, Jesse, you wanted to get back in on this? Yeah. One of the things I'm not sure about is if there's a looping function in BitFocus. Is there a loop command in the one you suggested, Alex? Yeah. Shortcuts, Apple shortcuts. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. And and that's pretty new in the Apple ecosystem, and they support those kind of peripheral programs pretty well. They're always developing. Well, they have such again, a huge it's, development team. It's the, the, the short, you know, Mix Effect Pro sees shortcuts, and shortcuts, that's a pretty simple operation on shortcuts, and so you can, you can uh, very easily just have them talk to each other. You can also use something that was using OSC, Open Sound com, um, Control Command, um, to, uh, uh, to, to do something else. But the easiest way to automate it on a Mac would be with uh, shortcuts. Let's go to our next question. Mieri Susha Miera in Wabalo writes in, what SDI cables do you use? Not the brand name, but the model stamped on the cable. And who made that part? How long does the SDI cable go before it stops working? Courtney Gooden, you want to start us off on Cable 101? Uh, well, the cable type for, for SDI cables, you want, probably want to go with RG6 cables, which is the type of... Uh, it's a diameter type of cable and the, the diameter of the dielectric inside. Those are pretty thick and they're a little hard to manage because they're fairly stiff. Uh, but that'll give you the longest distance. You probably don't want to run SDI cable. It depends on also for whether you're running 4K or 1080p. Uh, 1080p, you could probably get up to 100 meters or 350 feet uh, without any problems. Uh, and when it stops, it doesn't necessarily stop working. But it will start to get sparkles. You know, you'll see dropouts. Uh, they won't be necessarily physical dropouts unless it's losing sync. But you'll see, start to see a little noise in the image, little sparkly things going on. And that's a sign that your cable's too long or your impedance doesn't match or, you know, the signal isn't getting through with enough uh, level to be solid. So uh, RG59 works too for short cables. Uh, it's a smaller diameter, and there's there's another one I can't remember the number of the for the micro SDI, but I would not run those except for patch cables or within a case, for example. Whether you got to run a bunch of SDI cables around inside the case, there are there are many SDI uh, cables, many BNC cables, uh, coax, many coax uh, that can be run uh, run SDI cables uh, for short lengths up to about ten feet or so. Well done. Let's go to the next question. Coming in from the QR code, Gabriela Susan Miestra in Susan Marie writes in, Amazon's Echo options fully support the new smart home standard Matter over both Thread and Wi-Fi. So has Matter really arrived? What do you think, Alex? Has it? No. 
<laughs> no, it is not. Um, this, this, I mean, the home uh, vertical is just a complete disaster. Um, you know, I think people are, are can hack their way through it, and people who are very technical, like Courtney, can do it. Um, but you know, it's just such a disaster. Like the the whole interface of how they built this, and Matter was supposed to do something better, and I don't, I don't, I don't think it's approved it. I mean, I don't think they've they've gotten there, and it's such a big, wide open market. Um, I'm I'm surprised at how quirky and weird. Um, the home automation has been, I think mostly because it has a lot of technical um, debt. You know, all these people have done stuff in the past and, and they want it to stay the same or they want to work with the stuff they already had rather than just actually building something that actually works. Courtney, your name checked. What do you think? Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> matter doesn't matter. <laughs> There's no, a t-shirt uh, in there somewhere. No, the problem is that they tried to move to a, a standard that everybody could get on. And the problem is not everybody supported it. When not everybody supports a standard, then it's not a standard. So there are thousands and thousands of different uh, little uh, internet of things, modules out there that run LED lights, that turn on your coffee pot, that uh, you know turn on uh, little light switches, little light switch modules, uh, bulbs that uh, you can communicate over uh, the Amazon Echo with. All of them have uh, built their entire infrastructure on communicating with the old stand, the old method of of uh, protocol, the old protocol, and uh, it would cost them a huge amount of money to re-engineer all those items to go with Matter. So they are reluctant to do so. So all those Chinese manufacturers that are making about ninety percent of the stuff out there that communicates over Wi-Fi and interfaces with Amazon Echo and the Google Home. Don't want to, you know, rewrite all their protocol, reburn all their firmware. And some of it maybe can't be done remotely. You can't update the firmware in the modules themselves. So that's going to obsolete them. Unless they're looking at being able to sell a lot more stuff because it's matter, you know, supports matter. I doubt a lot of them are going to change. So you're going to still run into a mess of incompatibility because some are matter compatible and some aren't. So your Amazon Echo is going to have to deliver both protocols in order to turn everything on and off. Uh, and Amazon is looking for a way to just charge you to use your Echo every month, which is what they're doing. Follow up, Alex. I don't think this is going to get fixed until whether it's Google or Amazon or Apple just starts making their own devices. And, and the, the standards is the problem. Like, the, you know, that the, they just need somebody to vertically say, we're just going to make all our devices. We don't care about, inter, you know, we can have the standard. So if you want to use something else, if you want to use Matter or whatever they, Zigbee or whatever the, you know, the next, the next uh, version of standards that aren't a standard um, move forward, you can use them. But we have our own internal protocol and they all work. <laughs> like when you plug them in, they all talk to each other and they all work. Um, and and I'm, I, I, any the first big company that decides to do that will probably be pretty successful and make billions from that because people just want a basic number of things. They want their outlet. They want their lock. They want their camera. They want their lights. You know, those types of things. There's like five or six different things that is like 90% of what people want to buy. And you could just make those and just have them all talk to each other. Give them an S1 chip or W1 chip or whatever Apple does or Amazon or Google, but it's one of these big companies just needs to, to continue to support a standard, but then just build the core um, of what they need with things that just work. Um, and I think that, you know, it, again, for Apple, it'd probably be a hobby, but it'd probably make $10 billion, $20 billion a year. Daniel Partridge in the chat says, go back to X10 home automation, get rid of all this stuff. <laughs> so if you have your radio and I say all this as someone who's been, I just want to say, I say all this as someone who's been fiddling with this for a decade, you know, and just yeah. finally gave up. Like I was just like, enough, you know, I just want switches, you know, like it just, it just all, it would work for months and then suddenly it just stops working, you know, like, and I'm just, I'm done. You know, and there's nothing for, more frustrating than having a subsystem that's working fine and you get an upgrade and suddenly it just doesn't talk to anything. Yeah, I have this, I have this outlet that I used to be able to, and people saw me do it with my watch and I had it with my phone and now I have to like, I have to turn it, unplug it and plug it back in and then do a reset and then do all this other stuff for no, nothing changed. It just suddenly isn't responding anymore. Fortunately, it's got little buttons so I can push little buttons and turn the lights on. But it was just, it was just like, oh man, you know, and I've had to do it twice now and I just gave up and I was like, I'm just going to just push the buttons and call it a day. And so I just think that we just need to, a big company needs to just get, you know, they can support the standards for people, but they just should just build something that just talks amongst themselves um, using their own network and stop trying to make it work with, through the standard, just do what they're going to do. Next question. 
Paul Walhoofs in Austin, Texas, writes in, discuss the spacing of camera, lights, computers, cables, etc. in an idealist panelist, in an ideal panelist setup for office hours. Ooh, this will be interesting. Jesse Kester, start us off. Hey, let's let's talk about what I'm doing wrong with this setup because there's that's a that's a great place to start. Um, what what we've got the worst of it is that the camera is right on me. So if you see like it, it's just a little too close, and you want to be pulling that camera further back, starting at a 50 millimeter. I'm on like a 28 or 35 or something at this distance. Um, the light is also smashed up on me. That's not the biggest problem. It kind of looks okay, I'd say. And the other massive problem is just what's going on behind me. You got to have something. I got nothing. Alex, do you want to talk about this? I mean, you know, there's, uh, you, you can choose. I actually think that my background, and I'm kind of thinking about this for the next one, is probably potentially too far away. Um, it's it's pretty far out of focus. It might be might want to be a little bit closer, but we'll see how that goes. Um, but it, it, it also depends on the camera, the lens, everything else. So I'm on a Super 35 um, sensor with a um, a pretty, a very fast lens, a 1.4 lens. And so and it's pretty wide open. So it drops off pretty fast and I could tighten that up a little bit, but it all depends on your, on what, what you, what you have in your background. Um, I, I think that my background in more focus would, uh, just look like trash. <laughs> you know, like it's other than court, other than Courtney's fine, uh, fine. Um, uh, uh um, uh, scope that's here. Most of the stuff is stuff that I, you know, that's the thing that I'm, <laughs> I really want to get running. Um, the other stuff is all stuff that, you know, I used to have, it used to be worth a bunch of things and now it's not. So, um, the, uh, uh, but I think that I, you know, so I'm trying to straighten that up a little bit. So I leave it way out of focus because it protects me <laughs> from, from looking silly. Um, so, uh, so I think that it really depends on, on what you're looking for. I do think a, a, a drop off, uh, something that's soft behind you, um, allows people to focus on you and not on your background. And so it, and very YouTube-y kind of, you know, look to it. So, so I think that that, I, I do prefer that over everything being sharp. Um, I, I don't think that I want to build something that requires people to, I mean, allows people to like look at it. I think that's a big distraction. So, so I guess I would say that I'm about four feet from my camera. So I'm about four feet from my camera. It's a 35 mil on a super 35. So this is the framing. I'm probably just slightly too big in frame. Um, and so I'm working on that, um, to, to fix that, but I'm, but that's, that's where I sit right now. There's a solid nine feet behind me to the, to the wall. So there's, um, so that's a pretty long throw, um, to that, to that wall. And that, that's what creates that depth of field. Courtney Gooden. Well, I, I go a, a different route. Uh, besides uh, what appears in the frame, the camera to person spacing, I have my camera within arm's reach. See, I can almost touch the lens. If I lean forward, I can reach it and reframe. That's important for me because I don't have a PTZ and I don't have a, a remote uh, um, a zoom on my camera or any type of remote on this Canon uh, Canon DSLR. Uh, so that's important. Um as uh, everybody else has covered the background and the distance and space and the proper size, et cetera. Uh, mine isn't within arm reach for, for physical operation of a panelist to be able to, to reach all of the hardware. I have a little different situation. I have a console that has the camera, one main screen and the, the keyboards in front of me. And then I have my off to the side. I have this little thing sitting on a chair, which has my, uh, roadcaster pro and I built a little, uh, deck to a little uh, stand to hold the a10 mini just slightly above it so it's all within my right arm's reach and it's on a on a uh, sitting on a chair that's on wheels so i can roll it up right next to me and uh, all the cables then gather together and go down the side and off that chair in a big bundle uh from with all the you know xlr cables and all the hdmi cables the power cables it all runs off in a bundle so i can move it around move it out of the way if i need to so that makes it handy because it's movable. I can keep it right under my right hand. Also, my mouse is it's sitting, that whole mess that I just showed you is sitting on top of a little box now that has a uh, a door in the front of it where my mouse is. So it's on a level underneath the uh, underneath the uh, the uh, mixer is where my right hand goes to, to operate the mouse. So it's very convenient. So I'll play a little bit here. Um, I'm going to go to a photo in just a second. But for me, it's all about triangulation. That's when I set up a thing. We have a standard here at Office Hours, which is we're center framed. And we do that because we do um, 
insets of our shots a lot. So if we're off center, which is what I prefer, actually, if I'm shooting someone on, you know, putting them a little bit lean right or lean left just to get some variation in the frame. But for what we're doing here, I like it in the center. Uh, you talked about lighting. So here is a very tight shot. Sorry about that. Of uh, what I'm looking at here. And if I can zoom into this, there we go. Uh, you will see that my lighting is kind of triangular and that there's an overhead softbox that's lighting me predominantly, then two small lights in front of me to add fill on left and right side. Um, I like that kind of triangular fill. If I were to kill the key light on me, uh, oops, let me get back to the shot here so you can see what's happening. If I kill the key light on me, which is that, you'll see that's those are the two little lights that are giving my face some pop there. I've also got that little light on the computer in the back and, and the desk lamp, which are kind of my highlights in there. If I turn my key back on and turn off, whoops, what happened there? There we go, I'm still there. I thought for a minute I had disabled everything. Um, that's that one overhead light. And you can see it's making me look a little uh, horror filmish, but it's the predominant light on me. So when I turn in the other key lights, it adds a little bit of uh, fill light to my face on both sides. It's kind of a modified butterfly thing. And I can actually change it a little bit. If I decide I want more or less light on my right cheek, all I have to do is swivel those around. So I find that kind of triangular setup, fill from the sides, an overhead key that's going to cast a nice shadow and get rid of some of the chin issues that most of us, after we get past our 20s and 30s, uh, run into. That's how I've set everything up. And then Jason wanted to talk about it. So Jason, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> While we're all sharing, I'm going to cut to a, a why just to give you a sense of this. And... Um, so for reference, I'm, I'm about 6'3", and I can't touch the teleprompter in front of me. Uh, let me turn that off so you can see the rest of this. There's a large globe, and then I've got combed lighting here and then here, which I can kick off because uh, my my matter does work. Sorry, Alex. Uh, I'll kick off everything but, but that. And what it ends up showing is just kind of a, a very almost low and moody setup. I, I will do that on occasion, but for the most part, I like mostly flat lighting. Uh, as far as what's behind me, it's, I don't know, maybe halfway within arm's reach. I, I can't reach that either, but it's about as far away as the camera. And this is a 2.8 running um, a 6K Pro. So it's a, a full frame sensor and, um, and a 24 to 70, yeah, 2.8 uh, Canon Pro lens. So there's your variance. Jesse Kester. Um, Jason, quick question. Is that from Ikea, the pencil? You bet it is. And okay. it actually <laughs> color shifts, but I didn't want to do that because I thought it would be too distracting. But it looks supremely cool when it rolls through the spectrum. Because I was walking <laughs> through Ikea and I saw it and I thought, where did I see that? Where did it? Was it? Yeah, Who buddy, I got I'm it. I'm glad to, we did this check because now I, I li linked it up. Is that the elixir of life that you use to stay young back there in that little bottle? That's yes, going? yes, yes. <laughs> that's it. All right. Hopefully, Paul, that gave you some ideas about the spacing of everything. I do kind of agree. A couple of people have said keep everything close because you don't want to be getting up and trying to adjust things a lot. If Anything you can reach is a good thing. Let's go to the next question. Alex Forty Golner in London, UK writes in, any recommendations for third-party spatial video recording apps for the iPhone? I've heard of Spatialify, Spatial Camera, Spatial Space Camera, VP Camera, and Anglif. Are there any uh, rudimentary for volumetric video and record 3D for point clouds? Thankfully, we have Alex here who has been playing with us a while. Alex, take it away. Uh, yeah, I have to admit that most of my focus has really been on Stream Voodoo's, um, you know, uh, their camera. So, so their, um, so the the Voodoo camera, spatial camera, is the one that I've been doing the most work with, and that's doing live streaming to an Apple Vision Pro. Um, uh, spatial Fi is another one that I've played with a little bit. I haven't done very much with it, but I'm you know excited about that. Other than that. Most of my video shooting, if I just want to video shoot for my phone, has been done with the Apple app. Um, you know, so I've been just using the Apple um, software to do it. Um, I'm kind of interested to see if Black Magic goes into that path. And also, you know, I mean, there's, you know, Halide is another one that could potentially start doing 3D 
photos if they felt like it. So it would be interesting to see. But there's you're listing off ones that I didn't even know existed. So I'm going to I copy and pasted that into my notes and I'll do some more research. So we'll see. We'll see what there is to look at there. Nice. Next question. Kyle Hammond writes in from Chicago, Illinois. Do I see an office hours T-shirt? Well, sure where there, last night? <laughs> oh, there it is. All right. So, so this is the test one. It's uh, it, and so Nigel has been doing the most of the hard work of getting this through. But, but I got a test shirt today, and I, I kind of like it. I, I was, I was like, I, I didn't know if I would like it in the center. I mean, we were talking about putting it in the center. This came because Nick Joshishin did a demo of uh you know of unreal and he put the logo in the center and was like oh i kind of like that that's kind of cool and um so anyway so this is the this is uh the the test version of the shirt which means is that the shirt two-thirds is neutral gray alex or, or black i can't really tell it's, it's gray it's gray uh and i don't know if it's perfect uh uh 18 gray but it's not very far from it um and so uh so anyway so this is this is where we're going it's got a office hours global on the sh- on the sleeve um, and so, um, so I, anyway, I think that we're, uh, we're pretty close. So, so stay tuned. Um, uh, I think, uh, we'll probably put these on order pretty soon. Um, I'm, I think I'm pretty happy with it. So there you go. You should put it on the Fenwick framer and see if you need to move it up a little, get the whole logo in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> put the Fenwick framer the Fenwick and put framer. the office It'll be like a little it. circle here. There'll be like your head up here and then like a little circle in here and that manages the, the process there. So, there so anyway, go. so, um, so hopefully we'll, uh, um, uh, have these ready to go in a couple weeks. Nice, nice. Next question. Uh, coming in from the QR code, Mary Ali Shushamiera in Wabalo writes in, Alex, congrats on the LP show last week. It was amazing. How did you choose the cameras to use and which ones to show on the stream? How did a big softbox over the stage work? Alex, take it away. I don't know whether this is me or the other Alex. Uh, you know, so this this question had been kind of floating around in in there, and I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what show this was. I don't know what LP means, so I don't. I wasn't sure. We, I went ahead and brought it up because I maybe so, I thought some, maybe someone else would remind me of what Lincoln what I was Park. About. I I don't know. Yeah, so I don't. Yeah. I don't. Uh, um, I am not certain uh, what uh, what this was referring to. Um, so uh, so maybe have a specific one but if you shorten things for me a lot of times i won't my life moves so quickly that if you do anything that is it makes me think about the reference i might not know where where it came from so i'm not sure what that means so anyway so um go ahead and maybe put it in again and i will go from there and we'll check with alexander when he's yeah it might have been alexander maybe it was something well. yeah mm-hmm. there you go next question douglas carmichael writes in google is offering symmetric eight by eight gigabit fiber internet in select markets. What residential use cases could you see for said speeds? The answer is anybody who's on office hours regularly Mm -hmm. would love to get a hold of symmetric eight gig service. Courtney, start us off. Well, uh, for residential use, uh, you know, unless you're operating a business where you you have a remote production going on with and you're sending a whole lot of media files back and forth every day, uh, I don't really see the average resident needing it. I just switched to one gigabit symmetrical, and I'm looking for ways that it, I can use it. I mean, it's great for backing up stuff to the cloud. It goes a lot faster because your up speed is, is a gigabit, or I get about 890 megabits per second. Uh, 10 gigabit, yeah, your backups will go faster, but, you know, I do most of those in the background anyway, so I don't really care that it takes, you know, you know, it would go in one second instead of eight seconds, you know, that's kind of <laughs> indifferent. If I were producing media, you know, where I had a whole lot of media stored in the cloud or I had an editor working remotely that had to operate from a central cloud-based uh, 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 media files, then it would become useful. Uh, so that'd be about the only case I could see. I guess if you're an influencer and you have uh, remote people that have to access your video to edit it or work on it or get approvals on it, then it would come in handy. Alex. Shame and ridicule. Shame and ridicule. That's what this is all about. So um, so it, is it useful? Courtney's 100% right. Not really. I mean, you, you could, I mean, I think that I was uploading a file last night that was with a one gig connection. I would have loved for it to be an eight gig connection. It would have been, it was a lot of, it was a lot of data, gigs, many gigs of, of, of stuff that had to be uploaded, but it was okay, 10 minutes or whatever. Um, but the main thing is, 
is how consumers look at things is they look at a price. What Google wants is everybody to have faster connections. Um, that makes them more money. You, you surf more pages, you see more pages, you're more happy about the internet, you use it more, they make more money selling you ads. So that's what they need you to do is have a fast internet connection. The internet connection in the United States is painfully slow. Only, the reason it's not a complete embarrassment is because Canada is worse. So, um, but it is a, uh, but, but the United States, you know, it's, it is, we're tied down to basically corruption. I mean, the telecommunications industry is completely corrupt um, and it co has corrupted our politicians and they're not willing to do what, I don't talk about politics very much, but I think this one's a fair game because it's so obvious. <laughs> you know, we should be talking about this all the time. And it's the reason bipartisan. Your internet, <laughs> the reason your internet is, it's, it, it affects our business. So I feel like we can talk about it a little bit. The reason your internet is bad is because telecommunications companies give lots of money to politicians to not mess with their business model. And so, so what Google's doing here is they are putting something out really fast for not very much money. Are they making any money on it? Probably not. Are they shaming all of the other cable networks? Because now what happens is people see this news and they go, oh, how much are they charging? Oh, they're only charging $150 for eight gigs up and down. That makes their Verizon connection and their Comcast connection and every other connection look dumb. So they're like, oh my gosh, I'm getting barely anything. I just wish I was somewhere where Google was. And, and you know, and so it's, they are doing this to embarrass the cable, the cable provider, your internet providers into giving you one gig symmetrical or two gig symmetrical because, um, because, it, because they're going to, you know, giving you, you know, by giving it to you symmetrically, you notice, like for instance, I have about 800 down and about 40 up. You know, that's, that's what I get from Comcast. Um, and, uh, and so, and that feels just dumb, you know, because Google's doing this. And so what, so I, so that's what, that's the goal is to make, make the other telecommunications uh, companies look dumb. And if our government can't fix this, then Google is going to try. Uh, let's see. Next question. Coming in from the QR code, Mariotti Shushahmiera and Rabolo writes in, what is IP Relay and how do I use it for accessibility with my disability? Thanks. Alex. You would have to let us know what your disability is. <laughs> so I don't, we don't know what that is, uh, you know, what it is specifically. Um, uh, IP Relay is typically used to do, um, I believe, my understanding of IP Relay is um, it's going to take uh, voice and text and allow you to interchange them so that you can communicate if you're, um, you know, and, and it can do a lot of different things related to that. But, but, I, um, but you would have to give us more specifics. You know, I uh, did some, uh, I was interacting a little bit. I used to do a lot of volunteer work for a community of folks with vision impairments. And um, relay for the telephone system is often connecting your type written to somebody who can then speak into the conversation on a telephone line or something like that. That is the relay service that I am used to. So for those people who need that kind of service, if you need to interact in real time, you know you can type quickly enough to, to send the back and forth conversation that way, but you'd like the person on the other end to actually have a human being that these relay services allow the person reading it in the central office to turn around and speak it to the person on the other side. I've had a couple of circumstances where somebody needed to communicate with me through those services. And hats off to all the people who make that available for the disabled community out there. It is a fabulous thing for the people who are facing these kind of issues day to day. It really makes their life easier. So hats off to them. I know nothing more than that. I've only interacted with it a couple of times, but it's one of those services like in the old days, I used to do some volunteer work for what used to be improperly called Recording for the Blind. Uh, they've changed to the Talking Book Library and things like that. And the people who need this, it really opens their lives up. And uh, I hats off again to, to all the people who work in these kind of systems to help people. Next question. Coming in from the QR code, Gabriano Susao Mestiera in Sault Ste. Marie writes in, Digico consoles offer a rudimentary instant messaging feature between consoles on the same fiber optic network. What would be the advantage of, the com of this compared to using a messaging app on a laptop or a console compared to console intercoms? Courtney Gooden. I'm not sure uh, other than uh, or how this is implemented, whether it's you just type it in on the console and one. If you have a if you have a facility, let's say that has seven mixing rooms, 
and you want to be able to uh, send messages or you're in mixing room A and you want to suddenly you're bumped out of that room because you're going over schedule and you got to move to mixing room B. Maybe you can send, uh, besides your, your setup files, you can send things like channel strip information or your coffee order for lunch <laughs> over to the other over to the other room, or you can send messages back and forth without having to interrupt a session. Uh, since you're mixing audio, a lot of times you don't want to have an intercom blare in the middle of a mix session or recording session into the room. So uh, it's it might be a way to be able to send text messages back and forth discreetly uh, without interrupting a session that's going on in another room. So that that might be a way it's useful. Other than that, unless you can send text files that are utilized by the console itself for let's say setup files or labeling files or track assignment files, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm not sure what the limited use would be other than, you know, that you couldn't do with your uh, cell phone. Next question. Coming in from the QR code, Andre Doel in Berlin writes in, anyone seen the mini series, The Undoing? I just discovered it. Exceptionally good camera and very catching shots, thoughts, and he includes the Wikipedia link to the show. Oh, cool. Alex, have you seen this? I have not seen it. Um, I'm going to definitely check it out. I, I have to admit, I finally got into Slow Horses. So my son and I are watching Slow Horses, which I'm, I'm, I've am I'm become somewhat obsessed with. So I've got, I, I'm only in season two. So I've got uh, a couple weeks of Slow Horses to watch. I love getting in late because the, uh, you know, into these shows because it's, it is, it means that I get to watch a whole bunch of seasons in one, in one fail swoop and rather than waiting a year in between. So, um, so anyway, so I think that, uh, this might be something that, that we'll, uh, we'll take a look at with the Hugh Grant and Nicole Kidman in it. I'm sure that it's pretty good. It's probably, there's only one season. Um, so I think that it, that's all you could get with them. <laughs> you can't have them doing TV series over and over and over again, but it's, uh, so it's only six episodes and I, since it was done in 2020, probably be the only ones that we see there. So, um, so it looks like it'll be a nice little, for me, a one week snack. We'll watch it every night for, for a week and then it'll be done. Courtney. Yeah, to David E. Kelly, and if you like those thrillers or all the legal shows that he's done, he's a pretty good writer showrunner. So uh, I imagine it'll be pretty good. It looks looks interesting. It does. I'm not sure where it's streaming though. Is it? Uh, yeah, is I it think it was an it? HBO. So if it's streaming, HBO, it's probably yeah, on HBO. Max. So it's on Max. All right. Next question. Scott in Perth, Australia, writes in: What's the advantage of Synology Hybrid RAID? Jason, dive into it. Uh, so uh, SHR is, is the shorthand, and it's it's basically Synology's proprietary approach to RAID. It's designed to give you kind of the best of all worlds. With as few disks as possible, it's designed to be fast and redundant. That's that's the long and the short of it. Alex Lindsay. In a lot of ways, um, you know, it depends on, you know, people who are control freaks are not going to want to use this because it's going to optimize a lot of things for you. But what it, it's kind of Synology's version of a Drobo. Um, you can add storage to it and it will, you don't have to change all the drives. So you can keep on adding drives to it um, and it will simply expand those, re-optimize them uh, across that RAID and, and still have the redundancy. Um, so, but it, I think that it is, is as close to a Drobo as, as anybody else has gotten, which is you start just, it, it, or, Z, or a ZFS, uh, you know, volume where you're able to just start adding um, storage to it, it will re-optimize those um, and allow you to scale. So th that's, the, that's the main advantage. Next question. Coming in from the QR code, Gabriano Susan Mestiera in Susan Marie writes in, Amazon is supercharging Alexa with generative AI. What will be Siri's answer? And what will Hey Google do? The race is on. Can't wait to hear your comments, especially because Gordon. if you're using a speaker right now, you can hear all of them going nuts. <laughs> That's right. You've said all of them. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Courtney, dive in. Well, and you know, the only improvements, you know, uh, Google's gone to Gemini. And then Google search right now on most of my search boxes on all my machines, it will pop up the Gemini AI results first, and then it'll have the uh, search results down below that. The, I, I don't know, the, if you have a lot of kids, you know, I imagine the generative AI, since these are audio mostly audio devices, uh, you know, tell your kids a story, make up a story, a bedtime story. You don't have to tell, read the kids a bedtime story. Hey, hey lady, read them a bedtime story about that uh, crazy elf and the uh, unicorn. And it'll make up something and read it to them. And they will drift off to sleep uh, while she's chiming away in the background. Uh, that's one good use for it. Uh, you know, maybe to read you uh, uh, menus, I mean, uh, 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 cooking. Uh, <laughs> what am I 
trying to say, uh, in the kitchen so you can use it for uh, recipes. So it'll recite recipes to you, maybe all the steps. And you could, it could stop between each step when you've completed each step and you'd go next step and it would give you the next step and that kind of stuff. Uh, so you don't get your hands, uh, don't get your devices greasy that have screens on them by touching them and scrolling through the list of the recipe to, to see what's new. Other than that, I think it's kind of limited. Uh, they already answer questions. I use mine all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night and want to know if such and such an actor is still alive or not, or you know who was in that movie from 1936 that starred this. And usually it'll come up with an answer because uh, it'll find it on Wikipedia. But uh, you know, I don't know how, how well the AI is going to serve this market. Jesse Kester. I got to disagree a little bit. I feel like uh, it was kind of in the early 90s that we started searching for information on the World Wide Web in a manner that we've still been searching for it to this date. Um, generative AI, I really believe, is going to take off that huge bit of compression we've had on our thought where we have to take our ideas and think about how to feed them into the computer to get the information we want back. And the the change that will happen when we can just interact with computers on our terms, not on their terms, is going to be, I believe, the biggest aesthetic change in computing that I will see in my lifetime. And I want to know, Courtney, who are you waking up in the middle of the night and wondering if they're, Dick Miller and Abe Vigoda are gone, man. There's no one left to worry about. <laughs> For the longest time, people kept telling me Abe Vigoda was dead and he was still alive. For about 10 years, people thought he I still don't know who Carmen Miranda was married to. Alex Lindsay. I'm just goofing. Yeah, <laughs> I would, oh God. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see. I, I don't know if there's a big race, um, you know, to it. I, you know, I think that I think a lot of the press makes it out to be much tighter than it seems. I think um, I, for me, for the most part, and for my family, um, you know, ChatGPT kind of has filled the space, you know, and so the, the, whether these do it or not doesn't really mean anything to us at this point. Um, they would really have to, I think that they're, they, there's a race, I guess, for them to make sure that ChatGPT doesn't become the only thing people are using, but it is significantly better than anything else I've seen so far. As far as a general Q&A system, um, I find that I have it, you know, I have it opened or whatever and, talk, and I'm asking it questions all the time. So um, I, I, I don't think that, I haven't seen any of the other ones that are competitive. Um, maybe Apple will somewhere in the future or these other ones. But um, again, I don't have any, I also don't, won't have I won't put Google or Amazon products in my house <laughs> for a variety of reasons. <laughs> so 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 I I don't know how they work. So I so um, because I don't I, I used to have them and there's a couple couple things they did that kind of freaked me out. So I stopped using them. Next question. Stefan Fischer in Würzburg, Germany writes in, some YouTubers say they close comment sections due to massive intrusion through bots. They can't decide which are comments from real persons and which are from bots. What intention do these people have? Hmm. The invasion of the bots. Jesse Kester, what do you think? Um, I, I believe that uh, AI has been catastrophic for the community curation tools that we have on platforms like YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook. The, the ability for, uh, for bots to get in and just completely disrupt the, the actual honest and earnest interactions that a creator has with their, with their community is completely disruptive. It's, they've just had to move those interactions onto something like a private Discord server where the real, I don't want to say fans, the real member, and I don't want to say real either, but the members of the community who are actively involved and engaged with the creator can interact directly with that creator. And I'm hoping that uh, that these public platforms catch up to the tool sets that the private platforms have in place to help with this community curation. Alex? They're never going to win <laughs> the platforms. It's, it's too hard because, you know, what's required to do make the what's eventually going to be required is that people have to be verified you know and so and if, if and youtube tried to do this 10 years ago and the users of youtube the, even the creators fought against it um they were like oh we can't have to give up our handles you know and and be have a real name and do all those other things and and without that it's going to be very difficult to do that um also without turning off automation you know really what you have to do is say that a person has to verify that they are there when they post something um, you know, and, and that is something that, and, and add a little bit of friction there. And they don't want to do that because there's advertisers and there's all kinds of other things. There's, there's things that people want to automate. 
But if you want to have a personal connection with folks, you're going to have to make it personal. You're going to have to make someone work for it. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that's not what the platforms are ready to do. And without doing that, they can't win, you know? And so, um, the reason why do people do this? Um, some people do it to make money. You may think that, well, that little bot or whatever isn't making any money because it's putting up something that's obviously stupid, but somebody's clicking on it. It doesn't have to take very much because it's free to do the bot. So if it, if it goes out to a million people and a thousand people, you know, click on it 0.1%, they're going to make money on that. You know, so, so they, uh, so that's how these bots infiltrate. The other ones are, there's just some people out there that are just broken and just like to break things because they don't have anything else to do. So it's a mixture of people trying to shave off the, a slight surface and making money. It's kind of like day trading, um, you know, uh, uh, for, uh, for bots, um, or, and there's some people who are just, again, they're broken. They're trying to break other things and there's not, there, there isn't really a, a, a reason for it. Courtney. Yeah, as long as there are algorithmically driven uh, metrics and money, you know, traffic on the web, uh, people are going to want to game it. You know, they're going to game it for search engine optimization, for clicks. You know, you know, people will put comments in and said, oh, you thought that was good. Check out this website and put a link in there so that they'll uh, uh, try and, you know, monopolize on the comment section. And you can these days with AI, you can set up an AI bot probably to listen to each podcast that's published, uh, generate some cogent questions uh, with uh, and embed your link to your podcast in there and somehow lead it into referencing that and put it in the comment of all the things you subscribe to. So every day your little bots go out and uh, go to all your subscription channels and uh, watch those podcasts that have come out since the last time they were there and generate a res several responses with links on it to to game the SEO and move you up in the, you know, Google then, you know, uh, sends the spiders out across the web to gather that information. They find all these references to your website, link to your website, and that raises your search engine optimization. So as long as there's algorithmic uh, optimization for uh, social media and everything else, it'll be exploited by bots. As is typical on our show, we have uh, a good group of questions back there and not that much time to get to them. So your votes always count, but especially right now. So if you want to go in and make your preferences known as to which questions you want us to get to quicker, that will help us out. Let's go to the next one. Alex Forney. 4D Goldner in London, UK writes in, do you have recommendations for a print-on-demand t-shirt or mug maker that work in multiple countries so that shipping and taxes are as low as possible? Alex, what do you think? Um, I believe the one that most people use is Cafe Press. Um, so I, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of the quality of Cafe Press um, of the stuff that I've gotten in the past, but I do believe that they operate in a lot of places. So it just depends on what level you're hoping to work at. Um, but I think that as a general uh, way to handle to localize a lot of things, I think that's probably the best known one. Next question. Uh, Jeff in Easton writes in, is there a cheaper analog to Dante adapter with an input and output similar to the Audinate AVIO AES adapter, but for analog in and out? Boy, I wish I, I wish there was. Alex? Alex? Uh, well, there's Audinate makes one that's analog in and out. <laughs> so so I, I, I think that that's, I don't know how many, how many in and outs. They make a little one that does that. Um, the, uh, so there, and I, we, I have lots of those, um, and we use them often. So, uh, so I think that there's the Audinate one. Sound devices used to make one. I don't know if they still make the SD4, which is, I think, four in, four out. Um, there's a variety of ones that will do that. Um, there's a couple, uh, devices that will do embed and de-embed from SDI. Uh, I can't think of the name of the, the company at the moment, but, um, but it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, Mickey points out that RDL, Arista, and Proco have relatively for affordable interfaces. Focusrite, of course, has a bunch of interfaces for that as well. So those are a couple of other ones, but I'm not sure. If you're looking for a basic in and out, um, then, uh, then I would, then I still, I think Audinate's the best cost effective solution for that for like two in, two out. Next question. Rudy Hefner in New York City writes in, are there any features that the panelists find especially interesting on the $5,500 Canon EOS C80 full frame cinema camera announced for release in November? 
Alex, have you read anything about this beast? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing, I mean, I have to admit, the Canon interfaces drive me so crazy that I can't use the cameras. So they just they just make me upset working with them um, most of the time. Uh, so, but I think that the one thing that's interesting about this one is the 12G output. Um, that's the big update for that, if, if that's something that you... Um, you know, and, the, you know, if you want the 12 G from the computer, so that's going to give you 4k 60, um, out, out of the, uh, co the camera. So that's a, that's a big upgrade. Um, if, if a Canon is what you want, I don't really like the form factor. It's still kind of an SLR form factor. Um, and again, the way that Canon designs how you interface with the camera is maddening. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I think that that's the, um, so you really have to be committed to cameras, uh, Canon cameras to, to use it. Next question. Stefan Fischer in Wurzburg, Germany writes in, what is your experience with mail encryption? Which tools and protocols do you recommend? Jason Bache, help us okay, out. Okay, here we go. Um, email is inherently an, inc a, a, an in the clear thing. It's the way that it's always been designed. So in order to actually go from uh, one device to another device, to be encrypted, you actually need to do a protocol swap in between. So unless you have a G Suite Enterprise or have actually done the key pair exchange, I don't think whole message encryption is practical. It, it It's neat. I've gotten it to work, but it's a fair bit of work. I think your best bet is to simply just use um, signing and um, that, that will at least cryptographically sign the message so that somebody knows if it's not signed, it's probably not from one of your devices. Next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama City writes in, has anybody already tested the BMD Instant Replay and how would you compare this to the vMix Replay? Alex, help us out. I'm still trying, I'm still trying to get my head around why Resolve has an Instant Replay. Um, so I, I, it's on my list of things to go through and test. It feels just so odd. You know, um, you know, to have this big this big app and then have this instant replay built in. I feel like maybe they're testing it, but you know, if I'm doing instant replay, I just really want it to be an app that's designed to do instant replay. Um, and so I don't quite understand that process. I haven't used the vMix one, so you'd have to we'd have to take a look at that. But um, I, you know, we'll we'll try to play with that. I don't know, you know, when I'll get to the vMix part, but I am trying to get to the BMD part in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. And we've got time for one more. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Kjasdil Giersvold in Chomsu, Norway writes in, when syncing an H2R graphics project on the cloud or to the cloud and syncing it to another workstation, assets such as the logo image do not seem to be included in the project. Bug or does this need to be sent separately? Hmm. Alex, what do you think? Uh, I actually don't know. I think that it, I think you need to send it separately. I don't know if it's a bug or just a limitation. Um, so I, I do believe that that's what you are. Um, uh, you know, it, let's say it, oh, Edward, Ar oh yeah. So I, I was looking at something else. I was trying to find, see if someone was going to jump in there, but we'll go to the next one. No, question. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, syncing things, logo images don't seem to be included. So I wonder if that's a sidecar file with something or it, it, that's mm -hmm. a little tough to, to dig through and figure out. Uh, hey, maybe we have time to slip one more in. Question. Sure. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas writes in, what HDMI devices do you have attached to the ports of your ATEM mini or similar device? Jesse, do you want to help us out? Oh, yeah. We've got uh, external recorders, decimators, and we also have more ATEMs down the line because we use them to split signal and broadcast to different platforms at the same time. So you might see like two or three ATEMs uh, daisy chained uh, by, by the end of the day. Never have enough ports. Alex. Yeah, I had to look at my MV to figure out what I have here. So I've got a piece, I've got my main camera. That's what I have here. I have a PC that sometimes I take out and put in another camera if I want an overhead camera. I then have an Apple TV. That way I can share my iPad or iPhone or other things to the Apple TV, I mean, from to the Apple TV and then into the switcher. So just it is all purpose. I just want to put something into my switcher. And then the next three are my, I have a Zoom uh, Mac Mini, an Apps Mac Mini, and a Presentation Mac Mini. So those go into it so that I can, and the reason I do that is so that I can, when I'm doing presentations, I want to be able to switch between the computers. I don't want to say, okay, now I'm going to jump out of the presentation and open this app and I want to do this. I just, I just want to, I just want to be able to cut between all of them and have them all running in parallel. And so that's why I, I have it set up that way. And then the last one is my, um, my Telestrator, uh, which you can see here. So this is, this is my, my last one that, that goes in there. So those are the eight inputs that I have on my, and that's what, I, that's how I use it. Nice. 
Tomorrow, Wednesday, we're very excited. We're having audio hour. Wednesday is typically the day that we focus on uh, audio as Thursday is for video. And tomorrow we are having three generations of audio educators show up and talk live on our show. It should be really fun tomorrow. Robert Scoville, Bob McCarthy, and Michael Curtis have each been working in audio for a long time. They kind of represent three different generations. So you'll get a chance to ask your questions to people who have been in this for for a long time and deep knowledge about all questions audio. So if you have questions about audio, no matter what kind of equipment you have in front of you, tomorrow is your day. Uh, on Thursday, Todd Grimes. I'm really looking forward to this. Todd has worked with Toad the Wet Sprocket in the, been in the music business for a long time and can help you understand kind of the back end of what happens when somebody in the music business works in video, what support things do they provide and so 